Council Chair, we are now live. Thank you. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Um, due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We're using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligentsia prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now know that the hour has come. Mr. Iannuzzi, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are, that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words from responding so that you will be heard when you speak. Council Member Cindy Bath. Present, thank you very much. Looking forward to today's hearing. Council Member Allen Dunn. Present. Uh, good afternoon, and colleagues. Councilmember Helen Gim. Present. Good afternoon, colleagues. Councilmember Bobby Heenan. Present. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, Chairman. Councilmember Ken uh, Kenyatta Johnson. Present. Councilmember David O. Present. Good to see everyone. Council Member Maria Canona Sanchez. Chair Derek Green. Present. That's everyone, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Inuzi. A quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Finance regarding bill number 200347. Uh, Mr. Inuzi, will you please read the title of the bill? Bill number 200347, amending chapter 193200 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Keystone Opportunity Zone, Economic Development District, and Strategic Development Area to provide for additional extensions of certain benefits for the purpose of facilitating economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, Mr. Iannuzzi. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers um, should have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to be recorded. Additionally, prior to rec recognizing members for the questions or comments that they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Um, before we call the, the first panel, I'd like to recognize uh, Councilmember Kenyatta Johnson for some opening remarks on this bill. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, this bill will allow for an extension of a Keystone Opportunity Zone at the former site of Philadelphia Energy Solutions. Um, the current company that's in negotiation of purchasing this site is Hillco. Hillco Company was the actual site that was Hillco Company was the company that was approved on bankruptcy during the bankruptcy process to purchase on the former Philadelphia Energy Solutions site. Um, this, they are also are supported by um, the administration, which is who will give te testimony by the Commerce Department. But nevertheless, um, this is the beginning of the process to move forward and redeveloping um, the actual site. And representative from the Hillco can give an overview on uh, what their plans are um, for the particular site. Uh, I'm supportive of this legislation, and the reason why I'm introducing it is because um, this can be an economic engine. Um, and not only South Philadelphia, but most importantly, the Philadelphia region. And so um, the co company of Hillco came and gave a presentation um, to myself um, and my staff. And I believe it will be a great asset um, to this region when it comes to job training, um, job development, 
and they can give you more of the details overall on what to expect at the upcoming um, site. Why we're introducing this legislation at this particular point in time, when we talk about the issue of COVID-19, uh, one of the ways that we're going to come back in terms of our economy is making sure that we're providing um, jobs, making sure that our economy is moving forward. Uh, most of you may, may not know that recently, just as of today, uh, we were just told that we're going to see another $100 million um, deficit um, to our overall budget. And so uh, it's projects like this, I believe, that will help jumpstart our economy. It's projects like this that I believe will help put people back to work. Uh, we have the potential of generating up to 10,000 um, jobs. And so I'm a strong advocate around the issue of diversity and inclusion. Um, so those are part of the conversations as well. And not only on um, the construction and building of the site, but most importantly around professional services and contracts. Um, and so, um, again, I just wanted to give a brief statement on uh, my support and why I'm introducing this bill and just um, thank all the members and ask for your support. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Um, with that, Ms. Dinuzzi, will you please call the first panel of witnesses that we have to testify this afternoon? Dwayne Bum, Senior Deputy Director of the Department of Commerce for the City of Philadelphia. Good afternoon, Mr. Bum. Are you connected and ready to proceed? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Chairman Green, I am. Uh, thank you. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Baum, and I am the Senior Deputy Director with the Department of Commerce. I'm here this afternoon to provide testimony in support of Bill 200347, which would authorize the City of Philadelphia to apply to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the extension of Keystone Opportunity Zone benefits for a group of adjacent properties in South and Southwest Philadelphia. The Keystone Opportunity Zone or KOZ program is an economic development program created by the Commonwealth to stimulate investment and employment growth on vacant or underutilized properties. Businesses located in these specially designated KOZ zones are authorized to apply for state and local tax credits, exemptions and tax abatements for a term of up to 10 years. The KOZ program allows the city to spur economic development and attract businesses that may not otherwise choose to develop or locate in Philadelphia. The KOZ program has been a critical tool in the city's economic development toolkit, helping to offset the high cost of development in Philadelphia and attracting hundreds of millions of dollars in private investment and generating more than 100 or 10,000 local jobs in our city. In fact, much of the development in Philadelphia has seen in the past 20 years on vacant industrial sites has been incentivized in part by the KOZ program. The legislation before you today, sponsored by Councilman Johnson, will allow the city to apply to the Commonwealth for up to 10 years of KOZ benefits for several key development sites collectively referred to as the refinery complex. These parcels were previously authorized by city council and approved by the state for KOZ designation in 2014, when the refinery employing nearly 8,000 people was threatened with closure. At that time, Philadelphia Energy Solutions, or PES, had agreed to purchase the refinery from Sunoco based on an incentive package, including KOZ benefits. The economic viability of this large industrial site was threatened again last year, when a massive explosion closed the refinery operation on June 21st, 2019. Shortly thereafter, PES filed for filed for bankruptcy protection after determining that the reconstruction of the badly damaged refinery was not economically feasible. The managing director convened a series of meetings with city officials, community residents, and other stakeholders through, through last summer to develop recommendations on the future of the refinery site. The administration has remained very engaged throughout the bankruptcy proceedings and has worked directly with the selected bidder a Chicago-based company with experience in repositioning large contaminated sites for productive reuse. Once the sale is completed this summer, the new owner has committed to undertaking a comprehensive environmental cleanup of the former refinery site, consisting of an estimated $500 million. The full redevelopment of the site is projected to generate total investment in the billions of dollars over the next 10 years and the creation of approximately 10,000 permanent new jobs. 
Key to making this vision a reality is the need to extend the term of the KSD benefits for this 10 year redevelopment period. Timing is critical since one significant portion of the refinery site has KSD benefits expiring at the end of this year. In order, in order to keep KOZ benefits in place, the city is required to submit a KOZ extension application to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development at least 90 days prior to expiration or no later than October 1st of this year. The extension application must include a copy of legislation from city council authorizing the city to submit the application. As with previous rounds of KOZ extensions and designations, the city will require the new property owner to enter into a payment in lieu of taxes or pilot agreement in the amount of 110% of what otherwise would have been the real estate tax liability for the unimproved property for the duration of the KOZ benefits. Since there, are, there is already a pilot agreement in place for the refinery complex, the city will allow for assignment of the current agreement upon transfer of ownership. That pilot agreement is allocated to the school district and the general fund in the same proportion as real estate tax revenues. In addition to the 110% pilot and the long-term revenues that come with the redevelopment of the refinery complex, the city will seek apprenticeship and workforce opportunity plans for all phases of development seeking KOZ benefits. The KOZ program provides a unique opportunity to leverage educational and workforce development opportunities for all Philadelphians. The city remains committed to working with KOZ developers and businesses to ensure that we create meaningful opportunities to underserved Philadelphians, especially those from the neighborhoods that have been most impacted by this large environmentally contaminated site. In conclusion, the Keystone Opportunity Zone program plays a vital role in the continued economic development of Philadelphia and is a key to creating new jobs for our residents. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony here today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Ms. Baum. I want to recognize for the record that Councilmember Curtis Jones Jr. is also present for today's uh, hearing. Um, and I see he, as well as Councilor Heenan, has some questions. Uh, I just have some initial questions as well. You said that um, with this project that there will be a pilot for 110% um, of the revenue that will go to the general fund of school district, meaning that there will be 10% more income than they traditionally would have based on that pilot? That's, that's correct, uh, Councilman. They would have 110% more revenues then if there was no KOZ in place and we and the property owner was paying regular property taxes. Okay. Um, also, I had a question in reference to the fact that um, this was, there was previously a KOZ at this location that was approved by this body in 2014 and that this is asking for an extension of that and the application is due by October 1st, correct? That's correct. Right, and so the reason why your the administration is supporting this now is because the desire and goal was to have this legislation authorized to then go to um, the Commonwealth for that extension to be filed um, sooner than later, correct? That's right, we are required to submit an application no later than October 1st uh, and the extension, if approved, uh, would take effect on January 1st of 2021. Okay. Now, um, my understanding is that um, this, and I haven't filed all of the information regarding this issue, um, but I've seen some of the information from a, a periphery perspective in um, Councilman Johnson's district, um, and there was a sale to occur, and that was postponed? Uh, there was a sale scheduled to occur. It hasn't occurred yet. I, you, I don't know all the specifics of that. I believe it's mostly due to resolving the technical issues around easements on the site uh, between the current property owner, which is I think still Sunoco, uh, and the prospective buyer. And it's also my understanding that the prospective buyer uh, will be responsible for cleanup of that location? Yes, the, the buyer has already agreed to, to follow the, uh, the state's Act 2 process for voluntary cleanup uh, and again is projecting to spend uh, in the uh, order magnitude of $500 million for that environmental cleanup. Okay, but at this time, there's still a lot of outstanding issues that have not been finalized um, with this proposal as of yet. 
there are some outstanding issues. That's right. Okay. Uh, I'd like to note for the record that Councilmember Maria Kina Sanchez is also present um, for the hearing. I would now like to recognize Councilmember Curtis Jones for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And those were great, insightful questions that helped me to better understand where we were. And how are you today? Um, you always get the rough assignments. I always said that to you. Um, how much, and if you have estimates, feel free. I won't hold you to it. If you don't, please provide this, this information to the chairman. Um, how much is that land worth today? Uh, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. I can get you though the um, assessed value. I will get that to the chair. And if you don't know that, then what will be the value of it if it receives KOZ status? Generally, how does that enhance the value of, of properties? Well, the so we, we already know because there's a, a pilot agreement in place that the um, the buyer would be assuming. We know that the the uh, the pilot agreement right now uh, calls for payments uh, just above one and a quarter million dollars per year, um, um, and so that would be that those revenues that are have been coming in while the current owner uh, has operated the site as a KOZ have sort of gone to the general fund, 45% to the general fund approximately, and 55% to the school district. And so we would be continuing that revenue stream to those. Without KOZ, uh, we would be collecting effectively 10% less uh, for, for both those bodies. And I know that, that this probably um, is fluid, but what do you think the use of the property will be um, going forward, uh, I've heard everything from light industrial to uh, residential. If, if you were, and considering your considerable expertise from as far back as Wilmington, Delaware, what do you, what do you think it would look like there? And then I, I believe that there's a master planning process that uh, the purchaser is undertaking right now uh, my expectation would be that it would be some sort of mixed use development. Again, this is a, this is a huge site. This is 1300 acres, uh, approximately 2% of all land in the city are on the refinery site. So it's a huge property by far the largest industrial site in the city. And, uh, and, and Riverside, right? All of, it. all of it is Riverside too. That's right. It's, uh, it straddles both sides of the Schuylkill river. That's right. Um, uh, so because of its sort of location on interstate highways with direct rail access, close to the airport, close to the ports, uh, one would expect that sort of one significant use would be for logistics and distribution. Um, but there could be lots of other sort of uses, including light industrial or commercial. Um, we, I don't think we would expect that mixed use to include residential, just given the current sort of uh, environmental conditions of the site. Um, is it in your estimate, and I, I really want, Mr. Baum, I respect your opinion. Dwayne, do you think it has the potential of being close to the value of the Navy Yard? Uh, it's larger than the Navy Yard and uh, and I think equally well positioned and has some tremendous uh, infrastructure in place. And so, yes, it, I could see it being, having equal to or even higher value than the Navy Yard. So is it safe to say that that million dollars a year is a bargain? Uh, it does mean that over time, the property is going to have increased uh, assessed value, uh, but even without KOZ uh, benefits in place, the property would benefit from the 10 year real estate tax abatement on commercial properties. And so we wouldn't capture the tax basis for that until the, the 10 year abatement has expired. Without jeopardizing the deal at all, because I understand its importance. Um, 
Do you think there is room for a community benefits agreement within the deal? And that is not my dog, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think that that's absolutely worth the discussion. I mean, there are several large communities that are impacted by this, uh, and they should be part of the discussion for when this property uh, comes back to city council for rezoning, which it will need to, uh, that's the appropriate time to have that discussion. Um, I guess that's all I have for right now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Jones. I'd like to recognize Councilmember uh, Bobby Heenan. Is that your dog, Dwayne? No. No, that would be my my dog. Uh, uh, he's similar to Captain Chairman, Jack. Can you hear me? I, we can hear you, Council Member Heenan. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, apologize uh, for the delay, and thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for the hearing. Uh, Mr. Mr. Baum, uh, as always, uh, you know, I and this body hold you up with high regards and have the utmost respect for the omens work that you do and uh, the way you present uh, the issues on, on the betterment of a very nice blend within the city of Philadelphia and its community. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I am, I just want to start off by um, mentioning, you know, some of the questions that I have here today is, uh, do we have certain things in writing, not just commitments, not just, Yes, we'll be uh, discussing it, but in writing. And, and sadly, uh, the CEO, uh, Roberto Perez, is not here to answer some of those questions, although I know Hilco is represented by their attorney, and I, I don't want to welcome them uh, into this discussion. You know, but, you know, uh, Councilman Jones had just uh, started off, uh, you know, in, in the line of, you know, when, are, when do we have these discussions? So we're going to wait for a, a zoning overlay in September when there's approvals necessary now, uh, is there an opportunity for a, a community benefits agreement? I would hope so, uh, but we can't have those discussions now uh, because uh, Mr. Perez is not here. Uh, with that being said, uh, Dwayne, you had mentioned the timeline for the state in uh, authorizations of a of uh, of of the uh, of the KOZ is October first. Uh, is there time in the fall, meaning September, to approve this KOZ in September? Uh, with with think... all the uncertainties, you you had mentioned yourself that there are uh, some uncertainties and issues that have not been resolved yet. Uh, so technically, process wise, uh, can we as a body address this after due diligence in September? Or does it have to get done in committee today? Um, all I guess all I can say to, to respond to that uh, councilman is that we must submit an application no later than October 1st, uh, and that application must include some uh, key elements. Uh, those include an authorization by this body uh, authorizing us to submit the application. We need a companion piece of legislation from the school board uh, for the same reason. Um, and we will also um, require the, the purchaser to have executed a uh, payment in lieu of taxes prior to our submitting the um, the application. So, uh, you know, we will be submitting. That's okay. That's okay. I, I I understand. I don't I don't want to totally put you on the spot, but I'm I'm trying to make a point. Um, and you know, you had mentioned there's you know some missing elements here. Uh, one of the things uh, that and, and I'm a very uh, a big fan and supporter of KOZs. I believe in them. I think the school district gets, you know, it's 10% above its, uh, you know, you know, property, um, you know, land value now, uh, but it hasn't been assessed. So we really don't know at this point, 
what a pilot would look like other than just going off of what the prior use is. Uh, so how are we going to enter into a pilot agreement when the school district hasn't met over it? Now, I'm sure we could do a letter, but what would that letter look like? And what would the value of that letter be when we don't have a, uh, a sale? You know, they're, they're, they haven't gone to closing yet. And I don't know when that's going to be. You know, I'm hearing later this week, maybe next week, maybe next month. So I'm, I'm asking for things in writing today. And, you know, one of those things, you know, is, you know, the pilot. What are the dollar, dollar values? Uh, has Hilco entered into a, some sort of agreement on a, that? Can I have a point of information, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I recognize so, Council Member John, Johnson. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've answered, I've addressed um, the, the, the Hilco around this very same issue. Um, they did an analysis with the law firm at Stratley Rondon. So they're on the line to jump in and answer what questions they can um, and what information they can actually divulge prior to them um, closing on this deal. Um, I know a couple people asked about the community benefits agreement. Um, I've already been in conversation with Hillco regarding that aspect. There's two parts of legislation. Um, that addresses this development project. This is the beginning of the process and also overlay, um, but also significantly beyond the community of benefits agreement, we're also engaged in talking about the overall diversity and inclusion plan uh, for this particular project. And so I just wanted to just provide that information, but nevertheless, our representatives from the Hillco and Stratley Romans are available to answer any additional questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Councilman. Chair. Th thank Councilman. you, Council Member Johnson. Um, Councilman Heenan, if you can continue your questions, and then um, then I would like to recognize, I believe, Jeremy Gray from Hillco and Kevin Boyle from Stradley Ronan, if they could come on after you finish your question, your line of questions with Mr. Do with Mr. Bond. Excuse that, me. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, to my colleague and friend, uh, Councilman Johnson. You have never wavered on any of these issues, and I know you have been in. Uh, in the vanguard of uh, making sure that local people and local businesses have that opportunity. So, you know, keep uh, on the front lines and, and making sure that it reflects the goals and policies of this body. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I guess my, my questions uh, should be uh, asked to uh, Hilco and or their representatives. So, you know, I, I will defer uh, to them. Uh, because I do have some unanswered questions you know, that uh, was stated in, uh, in in this testimony from Dwayne Baum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilor Mahinen. I believe um, Jeremy Gray and Kevin Boyle, um, Ke Jeremy from Hillco and Kevin Boyle from Stradley Ronan are on the call. If either of you could answer the questions raised by Council Member Heenan. Um, before you begin to speak, please state your name um, and title and your organization for the record. Okay, well, this is Kevin Boyle from Stradley Ronin, and I'm gonna defer to Jeremy in a second, but um, uh, the pilot agreement in place, it is anticipated that would be assigned. And as it was discussed, the um, uh, community benefits agreement has come up in discussion and then that will be addressed during the uh, hearing on the zoning overlay district. I don't think there'll be issues there. Um, Jeremy, I think it would be useful for you to give uh, the councilman and the whole council board a general sense of what you know the best you can just, best you can predict with respect to the closing and also um, just the general construct of the multifaceted aspects of the proposed development and obviously the job creation um, and you know revenues that would still be generated by taxes and all the activity out of the site despite um, the existence of the KOZ. Great, well, thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. This is Jeremy Gray, Hilco Redevelopment Partners. I am the Executive Vice President of Development. Um, so appreciate everybody taking the time today. Uh, to answer a few questions, maybe starting with closing, um, we are, excited to say that it is imminent at this point um you know obviously it's very complex especially due to the pandemic uh, but we are talking now days not weeks so i just want to clarify that we're getting very close um, in terms of the overall development we are looking to redevelop the site into a state-of-the-art 
multi thousand thirteen sorry specifically thirteen hundred acre multimodal logistics park, which will encompass anywhere from thirteen to fifteen million square feet of state of the art logistics centers um, that are going to be utilizing the strategic infrastructure that's on site today, specifically rail, marine op op operations, and the close proximity to the airport. Um, these developments and these buildings will be very sustainable, um, but they state of the art. You know, from a sustainability perspective, uh, looking to put in solar panels on the roofs, looking to put in infrastructure for electric vehicles, and extensive landscape plans that we're looking forward to working with uh, the city and the councilman on as we develop those plans. Um, so that is an overview of the development. Um, that being said, we do have a draft economic impact study that we work through with a local consultant, eConsult, and they're projecting approximately 8,000 union construction workers and project professionals will be created over the lifetime of this project and also about 10,000 permanent long-term jobs. Um, this multi-billion dollar development will take about a decade to complete and we're looking you know from this economic impact study to generate between city wages, business and sale tax revenues of about 36 million dollars during the construction phase and $41 million annually after the site is fully operational, which will obviously further aid to the COVID-19 economic recovery. So we are very committed uh, to do an extensive community outreach program. I uh, heard uh, comments about a CBA, and like the councilman said, we have been talking um, about that and look forward to you know, furthering those discussions um, and taking the next steps. We're also working um, you know, with Councilman Johnson on uh, talking about a diverse uh, hiring plan that'll be very robust. Um, we, we, you know, the councilman indicated that that would be potentially um, put in an economic opportunity plan, an EOP, uh, which we are definitely open to doing and, and excited about doing. Diverse hiring is very critical to our core values. Uh, so things that we plan on doing are comprehensive, um, you know, project outreach plans, including, um, you know, job fairs, um, including different um, informational sessions, public transportation to make sure these jobs stay within the community um, and working with, you know, the councilman and the city of Philadelphia as we move forward. So, so those are, you know, just to kind of get an overview on some of the questions I heard, um, just some responses to those. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, I know uh, Councilman Heenan has some additional questions for you. I just want to follow up on one point um, in reference to uh, Mr. Boyle's uh, testimony. So my understanding from your testimony, as well as Mr. Bum's testimony, there'll be another piece of legislation that'll be introduced at a later point um, this year. That's a zoning overlay um, piece of legislation, which would be introduced by Councilmember Johnson. And part of that conversation there would be a community benefits agreement um, being discussed and negotiated during that legislative process. Is that correct? Uh, correct, Councilman. Okay. And that community and that zone overlay legislation would need to be completed prior to any additional steps beyond what we're doing today. That's correct, okay. Councilman. Thank, thank you. At this point, I'd like to recognize uh, Councilman Bobby Heenan for additional questions for Mr. Gray from Hillco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Gray, thank you for joining us here today. And you have to understand the magnitude, well, you do understand the magnitude of, of this deal, uh, but you know, it's an incredible responsibility for this body to really dive deep in, into making sure that uh, at 1300 acre, which used to employ a whole lot of, of people from Philadelphia in a region, all right, has the best opportunities and is vetted out completely and you know to me this is a little bit rushed uh, you know because we really haven't had that much conversation regarding this um, you know there's you know one on the pilots all right so my question to you is uh, you know when will that letter get done all right so you say that you know you're going to have a letter agreement all right when will that get done um, are you sure you're going to close on the deal uh, because you're asking us to take a little bit of a leap of faith and say, okay, um, you're going to close on a deal. I'm um, not sure what's, what's holding it up. You said COVID, uh, but you know, I think, you know, e-consult and other ones for an economic impact thing. I mean, they're working from home, right? They don't need to be on site. 
Uh, you know, so uh, is there anything that would hold back the closing on this deal on your end? And do you have in writing uh, that the uh, the guarantor or uh, the, the the partner from from the previous owner? is going to commit to $500 million for the remediation and cleanup of the environmental that they have there. All right. Is that in writing? Yeah. So, so again, this is Jeremy Gray. Thank you for those questions. Uh, you know, I would say on, on closing, um, we don't see anything um, that is going to hold us up. We, we are getting through all the documents and we are funded and, and ready to close. So that, that we are very confident about. Um, as it relates, um, you know, to your questions um, on the on the pilot, I would um, you know maybe defer to Kevin a little bit on the timing of that, but um, and and how that would go forward, Kevin. If you want to maybe Kevin Boyle from Stradley Gronin, um, explain that a little bit. Sure. So there's an existing pilot agreement in place, and basically, as soon as we get this legislation passed. We were going to commence negotiations uh, through Dwayne Baum, through the Commerce Department, and Christine Bach with the City Law Department to put in place the assignment of the agreement and acknowledge Hilco's assumption of the obligations under that agreement. And then, as it relates to the question on remediation, um, so <clears throat> we have been working very closely with the regulatory agencies, both paid up, US EPA, and others. I'm preparing a strategic plan um, to allow us to move forward. And we are going to be holistically incorporating and, and fully you know, aligning all the demolition, the remediation, and the development efforts for this site to take this through the Paid Up Act II voluntary cleanup program. Uh, really, that's the most modern way to do that. That includes providing an engineered barrier uh, for everything that we're proposing to develop, including building slabs, drive aisles, and parking lots. Um, new roadways and, and you know other infrastructure um, that really you know closes out the, the remediation. So that is something that you know we've been working not only with the agencies on, um, but also um, you know the former parties that have um, responsibilities, like you mentioned. Um, so we have agreements with them um, to work as partners to fully remediate the site, um, and that is you know committed to from a funding perspective on our end. So that is committed. So you you could put that in writing to um, to the appropriate party, saying that you know the capital investment for remediation. Uh, it, you know, I think you mentioned five hundred million dollar and estimated. Uh, you could put that in writing. We we are fully committed, yeah, to to um, remediate the site. That's part of the overall development plan. And we are going to put that plan in, into into action, you know, upon closing. Okay, so, so but my question, right? So I know you have full intent to. My question is, are are you are you, are you able to put it in writing, all right, or do you have to wait until after closing for some reason? The 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 intention um, we will have all those agreements um, and agreements with the agencies finalized before closing. Okay, is this deal? Uh, and, and size uh, so large that things are uh, it couldn't happen simultaneously and and uh, and concurrent like you know while you know the commercial land and the environmental land I know gets you know very complicated and and I know it's a complicated deal uh, but you know, it just seems to me things are in drafts all right there's a draft economic. Uh, um, you know, economic study. There's a draft EOP plan. Most times, when people come in and, and uh, developers and new owners come in front of city council, uh, when you know they're asking for incentives and approvals, um, you know they you know already have an EOP plan. They already have an economic impact plan. Uh, now, understanding that the EOP plan and some of these other plans and CBAs can be done at at a, at, at a zoning overlay. All right, I'm just. I'm just curious, you know, because we need, you know, we need to have this discussion and it's feeling rushed and it may be rushed. Uh, I just wish that things were, um, you know, executed and or, or finalized. Like a draft report is a final report with recommendations and letters are signed in funding. So, you know, I just wanted to uh, voice my concern and cautiousness 
it, with, with some of this, um, you know, and I didn't even touch on uh, the R, RGN, uh, and, you know, environmental reuse, I think is a wonderful idea, you know, with food waste. Uh, are they going to remain or are you going to move them or do you have a lease agreement with them uh, or are we just building out things on spec? So I appreciate your time. I'm going to defer some of my time uh, well, since I've been taking up a lot of it. Uh, to my my colleagues and friends, and I'll circle back with you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Heenan. I'd like to recognize Councilmember Helen Gim for a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you know, uh, this site uh, clearly is the first time that we've seen an opportunity for redevelopment since. Um, the Civil War, I guess, um, and that, you know, clearly the location of this area is near now one of the most densely populated areas along the eastern seaboard. Um, and so there has been a lot of active community engagement and involvement. Um, I get calls from my constituents on a regular basis about what is happening with the site, and I don't have a lot of information to be able to share with people. Um, so I guess one of, you know, one of the questions I want to start with a little bit is you, you kind of hinted at like establishing a state of the art facility. There's been allusions to, you know, the possibility of doing warehousing, transit use, foods, food waste, uh, you know, uh, executions, other types of industries. But could you be, could you give us a little bit more of specifics or, if you can't, because you know it seems to me that there might be an issue around your ability to articulate a clear plan for the industrial park, can Dwayne, can Mr. Bum articulate like, what has the city been told about what the actual purpose and design of the development will be? Yes, yeah, so th this is this is Jeremy Gray again. Um, I, I would, um, and thank you for your, your, your question. Uh, I would start by saying to the first question just about community outreach. We fully intend to do an extensive community outreach plan, uh, both um, you know with the electeds and with our local consulting team and with other partners and stakeholders as soon as um, possible, as soon as closing on the on the property. Uh, community engagement is absolutely critical to us. Um, it, it's very important to get feedback from the community as we're developing our plans. Um, but right now, what I would say is the master plan um, that we're, we're currently proposing is, um, you know, specifically showing light industrial, um, you know, called logistics centers that can be utilized as either e-commerce facilities, light manufacturing. Um, they could be, um, you know, used for last mile. Um, and then even some potential for um, R&D, research and development type facility. That's and the benefit there is that because of the location, the other infrastructure perspective that surround the property, such as rail and green docks, we really have a good opportunity for supply chain saving and also the ability to have um, these facilities um, really work with the community to have a strong as we move forward through the development. And can you establish more about in terms of like, I mean, obviously, as you know, there have been just tremendous concern from community members about the public health and environment of the area that the refinery was in operation. Um, and so as there version of the development, there has been a lot of discussion about the community recognized as one of the higher rates of childhood asthma. Um, there are concerns about education uh, in the area. Do you, are there, is there an ability for you to be more specific about what those design, um, you know, what the design might actually look like and how community members could be engaged with that? Absolutely. We, we are, we are very focused on having a sustainable industrial park at the end of the day. And specifically, we're looking to incorporate different initiatives, um, such as, for example, alternative energy um, abilities, 
A lot of our facilities have um, solar panels on the roofs of our facilities, which we can use to generate um, generate power, um, you know, obviously in a more green fashion. Also, um, we're focused on putting in infrastructure to accommodate electric vehicles. We see elect electrification of vehicles being the wave of the future. Um, so that's something that we're going to incorporate into our into our development as it relates to specific buildings. We're also looking and proposing to do an extensive landscape plan, um, specifically naturalized landscaping, bioswales um, that really look good from an aesthetic standpoint, but also provide a lot of environmental benefits as well. Um, lighting, we're looking to do LED lighting. Um, we're also looking, you know, as part of the overall redevelopment, um, in addition, you know, to, to doing everything per um, the Act the two. Um, voluntary program and <clears throat> we're looking to actually recycle as much material that's out there today that is possible. So for example, if we're uh, doing demolition, um, we're looking to use those materials after doing testing on those to use as backfill uh, to keep as much of that um, out of landfills and reuse it um, in a beneficial way. And then finally, I would say just again, the overall um, remediation plan is really to cap the site um, with, you know, like I mentioned before, the development components um, such as pavement and building slabs um, to, to fully remediate the site. And um, you're committed that before any kind of major demolition, there would be like full information sent to both the city and to nearby residents and that the city wouldn't be a substitute for information to residents so that there might not be, you know, a demolition of a particular area without residents being aware of it and certainly being hyper conscious about any, uh, you know, emissions or other types of things that might happen as a result of the demolition. Yes, correct, correct. And, you know, we, 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 we can, you know, we, we're proposing to do that in several different ways, whether it be community meetings, um, having active project websites, um, even, you know, doing robocalls, uh, sending out flyers. We're working with local um, community engagement and other consultants to really, you know, work, work together to make sure the community is informed. We're also, you know, going to be opening up an office in Philadelphia right on site um, that's going to have um, our, our staff there, you know, 24-7 and have local people um, that are working on behalf of Helco as well. So the goal is to have an extensive community outreach plan and be completely transparent as we go through the process. We just want to make sure that we avoid mistakes that have happened in other cities, for example. You can understand that. Understood. Um, so the legislation stipulates that the redevelopment project, uh, that the redevelopment is projected to generate about 10,000 permanent jobs. Um, you've the you've made a commitment to ensure that they're filled largely by local residents. Do you have a commitment around what types of jobs that they might be with a living wage and fair schedules and uh, appropriate benefits? We yeah we are going to be working with top tier tenants that have best hiring practices and are going to be good community partners. Ultimately, we're bringing in several different companies that the main driver besides the logistics advantages that I mentioned, which, you know, are close proximity to the airport, close proximity to the highway, rail, marine. The big driver here is the population and the fact that there is such a strong labor force. Um, so they are going to be very motivated to make sure that, you know, they are meeting and doing the right thing as it relates to, a, to, to wages. Yep. Um, Point of information. Yes. Uh, yes, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Johnson for a point of information. Yeah, just for the record, Jeremy, can you give an overview of your project in Baltimore for um, my colleague, Councilman Helen Gilm, please, and the rest of the members of the committee? Yes, yes. Um, so um, Baltimore was an old Bethlehem steel mill, <clears throat> very contaminated, that was purchased and developed before my time at Hillco. Um, several years ago, and that was taken through a comprehensive cleanup program um, with US EPA, um, the same region, Region 3, and redeveloped into a very similar um, type project, um, you know, that, that is a state-of-the-art um, 
industrial center um, that currently has about, I want to say, six to seven million square feet of um, industrial users and has been a huge job generator, you know, thousands of jobs um, for, for Baltimore. Um, so that site, um, again, 3,100 acres, it's probably about 60% to 70% built out, um, has been a very successful project for the region. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. I know that these projects can get very complicated and, um, I, you know, I am sure that one of the reasons why you are here and we are having this discussion about the KOZ is in large part because of, uh, of your work, um, in certain areas where it's been, ex you know, exceptional. Um, but as you know, you are a large company and there are other projects that haven't gone quite as well as uh, the Baltimore project. And I think one of the things that we just want to make sure of is that um, this project becomes one of your, uh, you know, one of the shining stars in your portfolio um, and, you know, is, uh, is a top tier uh, pointing to as to why the country can actually take um, antiquated uh, facilities and reconvert them into, you know, as you say, a state-of-the-art modern uh, vision. But that requires us to have a real commitment, um, first and foremost, to that environmental remediation that I think my council member Heenan was discussing, to know that we are going to have a commitment to do that. Um, and also, you know, again, that we are a city that struggles with poverty. We are making a conscious decision about taxation in a time when our budget is pretty much going belly up. Um, but we need a commitment to that living wage, fair schedules, decent benefits. Many warehousing facilities do not offer those things, for example. Top tier employers don't offer those types of things. So I just want to make clear that the, um, the focus will be whether or not the employer is considered like a top tier employer. We're in a world in which um, some of the wealthiest companies and stellar companies uh, in the nation can see CEOs and um, their, uh, you know, uh, their uh, shareholders see enormous benefits, but their employees can actually make pretty poverty wages or be on part-time schedules that keep them struggling, many of them being black and brown residents of our community. So I just want to reiterate again, you know, it's not that I don't deny that you would have a top tier employer uh, who would be a great partner with you. But part of this is guaranteeing that the jobs that we provide actually have a living wage, um, not a minimum wage, but a living wage, fair schedules and basic benefits that are consistent um, with our city's values. Understood, understood. So I guess the question is whether you can commit to that or whether this is going to have to be something that we discuss more, uh, you know, after the KOC is approved. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> from my perspective and, and, you know, Kevin, you could jump in, but obviously we're very committed to working with the city um, on exactly what you just mentioned, making sure that, you know, these jobs are, um, you know, good wage jobs that everybody's very happy with and they're long-term jobs and the jobs stay within the community and people are able to get to these jobs easily by enhancing public transportation and making sure these jobs are known, you know, through job fairs and working with local partners within the city of Philadelphia, um, different job force agencies, different agencies as it relates to chambers of commerce and, you know, really, um, you know, making sure the outreach is, 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 is very strong. Um, I think, you know, we are doing this all over the country. We've acquired 40 million square feet of obsolete, obsolete industrial sites um, across the country at, for redevelopment to better and higher use into state-of-the-art facilities. And we are committed to working with the city here to have a great development. We really are. Understood. I think, uh, all right. So one of the, I have a couple more questions and then we can, um, I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time, but, um, I do want to talk a 
a little bit more about what is the guarantee that many of these 10,000 jobs uh, will actually be filled by Philadelphians. Um, how can we ensure that there's a commitment that these jobs are actually filled by local residents, um, that we can make sure that, uh, for example, um, are, are the jobs for environmental remediation of the site included in the 10,000? Um, how, how are you looking at the guarantee about local residents filling it? And is there like a percentage that you're shooting for um, that we can be that we can be confident about that you're making? So I would say from the job projection perspective, um, just to be clear, the construction, the union construction workers and projected for pro and project professionals, those projections, that's about 8,000. The permanent jobs are about 10,000. So the total projections right now are looking to be 18,000 jobs between the two. Um, I think, you know, working closely with Philadelphia, Councilman Johnson, especially as it relates on relates to a diversity plan and a hiring plan. What I would envision is that we focus on keeping local hiring, um, you know, some some, you know, local hiring requirements in, in either a C, CBA or an EOP, as well as minority uh, business hiring and women owned business hiring, but ultimately looking to get feedback from the city of Philadelphia on what the best approach would be um, as it relates to that. How many of the 10,000 jobs can you guarantee will go to Philadelphia residents? That's a projection right now. I would say, in, in my opinion, the main reason our tenants are going to be looking, you know, to, to occupy the logistics centers we're building is because of the labor force in Philadelphia. How do we get somebody to work easily? How do, how does that happen? Um, so I would say the majority of them um, is something that we, we can focus on. Is majority 50%, 75%? What would the majority for you be? Again, I think it's subject to, you know, just um, finalizing requirements in an EOP or a CBA, but I, I would envision 50 is probably a minimum, um, just, you know, quite, quite frankly. Um, the goal is to make sure that these jobs are accessible um, by the community. Okay. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of confidence in uh, my council colleague, Councilman Johnson, who has been, you know, just a tremendous leader on uh, diversity, minority hiring, and especially local hiring. And I'm sure he'll be a great partner to hold you accountable to that. So I appreciate that. Um, the last thing is my question is for um, Mr. Bum. So uh, along with KSCs, have we begun to develop better benchmarks for our overall incentive programs? And, you know, to what extent that the benchmarks that are being applied, um, you know, and to what extent are these benchmarks being applied to something like this, which authorizes an expansion to the KOC program? Uh, council, uh, Councilman, um, uh, as you know, we, we um, did an analysis uh, this past year of um, our of, of seven of our key incentive programs, KOZ being one of those. Uh, the intention at that time was to help to use, uh, as we're benchmarking, to to uh, develop a sort of a new incentive program that that um, could replace some of the programs that we had, that consolidate some of the tax credits and other incentives that we had in place. Um, and we've worked with city council staff in putting that together. Um, uh, the challenge has been sort of in the now, during the current pandemic crisis, uh, all funding that we had ho hoped to put into that incentive program that would have sort of new sort of transparency and benchmarks was was by necessity uh, repositioned for immediately for relief for existing small businesses. And um, so in the short term, uh, and probably through the next 12 to 18 months, um, we will continue to focus all of our incentive efforts on how do we sort of support existing small business uh, across the city. Well, my question was about whether your department is taking a look at improved benchmarks, because right now, when we talk about KOZ programs, we, you know, I authored a piece of legislation back in 2016. In fact, it was the first one that I authorized that uh, required 
um, reporting back it four years or five years later has yielded marginal results. Most of them self-reported in terms of jobs, job quality, uh, retention, all of these kinds of things. And I think obviously we're deeply invested and hopeful about this particular project that's on the, um, you know, that is that is up for discussion. But there is a lot of concern that unless the city strengthens its benchmarks for establishing what actually qualifies for our incentives, we actually have no clue or no real ability to ascertain whether any jobs actually come to fruition, whether they're local, how much they pay, whether there are any kind of labor abuses that, that might occur on site, um, and then whether there are any clawbacks that are in place. Now, granted, I understand that this is our local approval on a state program, but we can also authorize a parallel uh, thing that should, that should strengthen uh, what we know to be very weak points in many of our incentive programs. So I'm trying to understand that I don't, you know, are you saying that you can't even establish better benchmarks for incentive programs that we know have uh, clear weaknesses? That's not a priority right now because of COVID and the current budget crisis. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Um, no, that's not. I, I, okay, I, good. And maybe, maybe. <laughs> Maybe specifically to KOZ, um, you're right. This is a state program, but it is, in fact, one where the where the, uh, the city through the Commerce Department works very closely with uh, the state through the Department of Community and Economic Development to uh, monitor the program. Uh, mm -hmm. When we uh, when we each uh, sort of business that serves participates in the program must submit an annual application to the state uh, that is jointly filed with the city for us to review to make sure the business is compliant with state and local requirements. Uh, we do take that very seriously um, and we and we do deny businesses if they have not uh, met the requirements uh, under the program. It, it's still a state program so we have limited sort of um, effect in but uh, but again we the state uh, in that annual application does now require some level of information about annual investments, about jobs created. Uh, mm -hmm. it, does, it does not give the level of detail that, in fact, we asked for in our annual financial re reporting requirement, the, the, the reporting that sort of is uh, conducted under the legislation that you had sponsored. Uh, but, but businesses do sort of provide uh, that information. It's on a voluntary basis, we in Congress uh, can't verify uh, the information because it is a uh, taxpayer has taxpayer confidentiality. So um, we can all we can sort of do is, is make sure that they've completed the form, uh, but we can't. Um, there's no way for us to sort of audit the uh, results of it. Yeah, I, right. I think that's my point. So I think you know, um, and I'll yield my time to the rest of my colleagues, but I think. We, the city needs to do a lot more on our level. Clearly, the legislation that we authored, and I think Council Member Dom also has done some companion and supplementary work as well to this area, but um, we're weak on this. And I think we need to figure out what local opportunities we have, especially as we're discussing expansion of legislation, um, how we can make sure that we tie some of these things uh, together now and not just wait or, you know, we, we know we've had five years of trying to get better information. And I think, you know, now is the time for us to strengthen some of this. And my office is happy to work with you. Um, and I'm sure like I'd be delighted to work with in partnership with uh, Council Member Dom and others who, who have shown interest in this area. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to yield my time. Thank you, Council Member Gim. Um, actually, before I go to Council Member Sanchez for additional question, um, uh, Mr. Baum, I just have some questions in reference to, I'm, I'm sorry, not Mr. Baum, Mr. Gray from Hilco. I just have some additional questions in reference to um, some of the things that were put on the record by Council Member Johnson, as well as yourself and others regarding um, this project. I know you're currently uh, either negotiating or marketing this location for potential tenants. 
Um, can you give a perspective? I know you probably cannot provide the nature or names of those tenants, but some of the types of jobs and give a little more detail. Um, you talked in a more macro perspective about the numbers of jobs, but if you could give a little more perspective on the types of jobs and from your understanding the, um, the salary ranges, you said tier one, but just want to get some perspective on the types of jobs and the salary ranges. Absolutely, and thank you. Um, so <clears throat> types of jobs really range anywhere from for the permanent jobs, um, logistics jobs, supply chain jobs, managerial positions, and then also um, warehouse positions, um, security, and trucking jobs. Um, and, and before you, you the types of, and more specifically when you said logistics, what are the type of positions within logistics? I mean, that's a very broad category. If you can sure, provide sure. a little more context of those type of jobs. And as well as others, we have made detail. Well, you may have more details. Absolutely. I mean, this is really all of our target um, tenants, if you will, you know, tenants that we're going to be marketing to um, really are going to be doing e-commerce, um, anything that benefits from from the supply chain advantages surrounding the site, light manufacturing, warehouse dis warehouse and distribution, um, and potentially, you know, some, some R&D, um, research and development type facilities as well. So when I say logistics, it, it is a wide range. Um, it could be anywhere from anything from, you know, who, who's managing how, you know, trucks are moving out of facilities and distribution network to products that are delivered to either, you know, one's home, if it's e-commerce, or if it's, you know, going to different distribution centers um, or different areas, um, you know, of, of, of the country. Um, so that, that could be, you know, a wide range of, of jobs. Um, it could also be focused on a lot of our tenants um, now that have uh, pretty significant build-outs have, you know, a high level of mechanization in their warehouses, you know, things like pick modules, conveyors, um, and things like that. So, so those kind of jobs, um, you know, really are, are from a supply chain perspective, uh, going to be proposed and generated by our tenants. Um, and then also I should mention there, there's, you know, with that level of build out that we're seeing with these tenants now, it, it is no longer, you know, just a tall or just a, a basically a, a, a typical box type development. It's very sophisticated um, from an equipment perspective. So you now have different uh, mechanical um, type jobs that could be created with that as well from a maintenance perspective. Um, and other other types of um, you know mechanical positions, so that that's you know just high level the jobs that we're we're targeting. Um, also, you'll have you know the rail facilities that are operating, um, so that you know are, are is going to generate jobs in the rail industry, um, and then also on the marine side, um, you'll have jobs that are generated from that perspective too. We're also uh, chairman proposing to have a commercial component here. When you create such economic um, an, an economic benefit like this and this large of a scale, you almost create your own ecosystem where you do need a place for different employees to grab gas or grab food or grab a sandwich. So we're also looking in, you know, having commercial components to the site um, that'll be able to serve, um, you know, those those services for the workers that are there working in the park. Um, thank you. And when you say logistics, it makes me think of the Philadelphia Regional Port Authority, um, which has a very significant logistics operation. So I would assume that those are some of the types of jobs you're talking about. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. And, and this will be very complementary, um, our development to that facility. Okay. And also just one other follow-up question before we... Um, uh, have Councilmember Sanchez weigh in with questions. Um, you also, in response to Councilmember Gim's um, questions, talked about some of the environmental perspectives at the location. You talked about um, solar panels um, and some other environmental initiatives. Is there going to be a desire to make this a uh, zero emissions or close to zero emissions location throughout this facility? We, we are going to work with our tenants to keep and, and try to implement programs to reduce emissions. Specifically, like I mentioned, infrastructure for electric vehicles. Uh, we see that as being something that's, you know, a wave of the future. And we're going to provide the infrastructure to support that 
um, assuming you know a tenant wants to make that decision. So that'll be incorporated into our into our design as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Uh, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Maria Kiana Sanchez for questions. Thank you, and I, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to have this discussion. I have a question for Dwayne and the administration, and then I would like to talk to the developer. Dwayne, um, it seems like this is such a regulatory light decision making. Was there an official request made to the state for a delay or a continuation so that we could do both this zoning overlay and this? together as opposed to rushing it like not that so was there a request made to the state and did they deny us uh, uh councilman there was not a request made to the state to extend the the filing deadline for the extension application if that's what you're asking that uh to the, the state could not administratively administratively grant that it would it would require state legislation to change the underlying uh uh, KOZ underlying legislation. Why? Uh, the, the, leg the, the, the legislation sort of establishes the, uh, the terms under which extensions can be requested uh, and, and applications must be submitted by local governments uh, at least 90 days prior to the current uh, expiration. Uh, so, so to if we want to go back, if we want to change the rules of the state legislation, that will require that will require new legislation. I just, re I just remember last time we were doing this approval process, and then Wolf moving it was a moving target around the KOZ. So I just again, just because this is such an important conversation for such an important parcel in our city, and notwithstanding you know, as, as my colleagues have, have said that uh, Councilman Johnson is going to try to navigate this as much as possible. Um, but we are adding an incredible amount, incredible amount of value to an unknown owner or, you know, perspective. And it's very uncomfortable um, for all of us to, to make, these com make these decisions silo. So I just also want to put that on the record. And again, you know, in the post-COVID world is is quite complicated, and and I get it. Um, as it relates to to the developers, you talked about that you were going to have a robust communications outreach strategy. Have those consultants been hired? Who are they? And do you have at least a framework of what that's going to look like that you can share to the committee before a final decision is made? Thank you, uh, Jer Jeremy Gray and Hilco. Um, so we, we are still framing up um, the final community outreach plan. And I, quite frankly, we'd like to you know work with the city to make sure everybody's on board before we fully implement it. But but at a high level, again, you know, a couple thoughts that we had that we've used in other projects, um, our community meetings, project websites, um, and you know, just making sure that we are able to get feedback from the community as these plans are developed and as we go you know, through um, the public process. So from a community engagement perspective, the community meetings, for example, you know, oftentimes we, we have workshop sessions where we have different stations set up um, specifically to each component of the development, whether it be, you know, the remediation or the proposed design and get feedback, um, you know, from the community in that form. Uh, we also want to make sure that the community is engaged as it relates to jobs, like we mentioned. So, you know, looking to partner up um, with local um, job agencies, Chamber of Commerce, both from a construction and project perspective, and then obviously the permanent jobs. So we are talking to different um, we are talking to different consultants right now that we're running an interview process on. Um, and we're close to making some final selections, but there's about three or four firms that were I'm still talking to. Um, so we plan on, you know, at closing to have that nailed down and begin that process immediately after closing. Um, what can you share from your previous um, projects, as you mentioned, Baltimore and others, that would help us um, clarify where your stance is going to be? You know, we constantly in the city have a a debate about who builds versus who works and the builders always win building trades builds and then the workers always 
we end up having to go back and clean up to make sure to Councilwoman Gim's point and others that there are fair wages and those are life-sustaining jobs. What from what is the language that you have in some of your other projects that you could share now as a framework of what direction you're looking to go since we seem to have like nothing in writing that we could later hold you accountable to? Yeah, I think like we mentioned, you know, we, we are committed to working with um, the city, you know, in, in the CBA or other documents to make sure that we're fully aligned from a hiring approach. Um, you know, we, we've, on other projects, <clears throat> have entered into uh, project labor agreements, um, which, you know, we're um, looking to do here. Um, and, you know, we have different um, hiring goals um, that we've entered into um, on other projects as well that relate to minority, women-owned, and um, local um, hiring um, practices. So really, you know, we're, we're, you know, committed to doing all of that um, when, when the time is appropriate and we, and we get, you know, through the closing. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. I, I guess I, I'm trying to get to a place where I feel comfortable that when this passes this committee and then ultimately the, the, the council, again, I know that we, the zoning and the overlay is coming. I just feel like there was so much community outcry on this particular parcel. Um, and in our rush to this, I want to make sure that we really could put in some benchmarks and some, you know, uh, uh, safe guardrails, right, for us to meet certain goals that I, and, um, and I'm a little concerned that, again, we're all interested in restarting the economy. We understand this is a big project, but I feel like, you know, we could have, we could have had a little bit more to feel more comfortable that in the next phases, some of those things were going to be addressed. And I'm trying, I'm trying to get there. And I, I, I appreciate all your responses to my council colleagues around some of this stuff. But um, I don't know, I, I just feel like on the labor side, on the job side, on the communications outreach, even a framework of what you propose your community outreach plan was going to be, even if you didn't have the who, but the how and the what. Um, would make us all feel a little bit better. So I don't know what the capacity is for the team to submit something like that to the chair um, so that all members of council have that before we ask them to vote in the next couple of weeks. But I feel like at least I need a framework of what that public engagement is going to be so that we can have folks feel in this post-COVID world that we're trying to be as transparent and inclusive as possible. Uh, this is Kevin Boyle. If I could just uh, interject here for a second, I just want to emphasize that we have a closing that's likely to happen within a very short time period, and it's basically the requirements of the state that are necessitating the timing of this particular legislation at this point. With the by the time the overlay district comes and the overlay district ordinance comes before you, I think many of the questions that you're raising now, um, with respect to what is being said and what is actually on paper um, will be much more defined. And once closing occurs, HOCO is going to be in a much better position to begin the community outreach and to provide much more of the um, documentation that you're looking for to back up the statements, which is clearly uh, understandable to HOCO that that's something that you would be seeking. But it's basically that the time constraints that we're under with respect to the KOZ that's necessitating um, why we're before you today, but but it but it's not as if this is it. There's still the, the zoning overlay that will give you a whole other series of uh, opportunities to um, have the documentation and have the agreements that you're looking to solidify. So maybe just the letter saying all of those things will come when that process happens, because we also don't want to wait till the end, right? We don't want to get wait till September and then Councilman Johnson has to present legislation. What is going to be happening between now and, and getting to that place? What are the steps that you're going to guarantee us are going to happen? There's going to be a robust community engagement plan. A consultant will be hired. Um, you know, we're going to have goals, you know, labor peace. You know, we're going to build a certain way and we're going to ensure family sustaining jobs. Even if it's just an attached letter that says we recognize these things, we have the experience 
and we've done it before and we commit to submit that to council as soon as those things become available with some benchmarks. I just, I don't want to be in a situation where, um, again, this is a major value piece that we don't have agreements around the values that council is hugely committed to and wants to see happen. If you agree with them, then that's easy enough to put in a letter and submit and we're all, you know, we'll hold you to that, right. As much as we can to, to that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, Councilmember Sanchez. And before we get to Councilmember Jones, who has a question, I just would like to state that I understand that you're, uh, this is to Mr. Gregg, you're in the process of identifying a consultant to help with the community outreach and to echo the commentary made by Councilmember Sanchez, I think it would be incumbent upon um, that consultant and I get a sense of the timeline for bringing that consultant as closely to the time of the closing um, but they should be putting together information, not only in the letter that Councilman Sanchez um, suggested, but also reaching out to various organizations and providing information in a public way through various um, means of communication from Philadelphia Tribune, Aldea, other communication mechanisms, as well as various organizations like the African American Chamber, Hispanic Chamber, and other similar organizations about um, the opportunities for Hilco um, for this project. And then I'll just ask one more question before I bring in Councilmember Jones. Um, can you give a perspective on the Baltimore project, the type of professionals that were brought in for that project? I know the Baltimore project and this project have differences, but there are probably some overlap in reference to the type of professionals that were brought in for on that project. Uh, so Chairman, from my perspective, from my perspective on the Baltimore project, it was a, a little before my time, all of the details. So why don't I reference the project that we're doing out in Chicago, um, just to give you a little bit of an overview on how we're approaching that. Um, <clears throat> here in Chicago, um, we have approached um, outreach with the community um, by partnering up with, with local communication firms and also local job agency uh, folks that are keeping um, jobs in the community, uh, specifically um, there's three or four different groups um, that we are hosting job fairs with um, that you know are are able to um, work with us not only on jobs but but um, community outreach. So they're you know from closing on that project, which you know we purchased back at the end of 2017 until today, um, there was over 125 examples of community outreach events that we host, for example. Um, so that in includes partnerships with uh, the Hispanic American Construction um, Industry Association, known as HACIA, also the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a uh, little village chamber of commerce, um, and those types of other other groups. So that that's just you know in Chicago at least what we've done. I know we've done a lot at Trade Point. I just wasn't personally involved with it because it was a little bit ahead of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gray, and if need be, we'll do some additional research research through some of our local elected officials in Chicago. And um, with that, I'd like to recognize uh, council member. Oh, yes. Point of information from Councilman Johnson. Yeah, just I just had a recommendation for the Commerce Department as well as Hill, Hillco. Um, if they would commit to uh, um, answering questions um, that were asked of, of my colleagues um, in writing prior to the submittal of the paperwork to the state in the fall, but also prior to us um, bringing the legislation out, I would also like for you to provide as much information as possible just as a follow-up um, to my colleagues um, regarding this particular bill. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. I'd like to recognize Council Member Jones for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's more of a statement than a question. I absolutely have faith in Council Member Johnson that he will negotiate um, the best community engagement plan that we can possibly extract for the city of Philadelphia. I would only ask that some of the zip codes include 19131, 19151, 191215011. Yeah, those. 50044. Because this is a regional asset, regional asset. I totally think that uh, Councilman Johnson having to deal with big institutions like the airport is not 
unfamiliar with those kinds of back and forth negotiations, so I trust that. This is just a dating process right now. And if you can hear, um, you, you came before the family and, and they, they asked you a whole bunch of questions before you ever even went on a prom. But if you intend to get married to the city of Philadelphia, you need to answer at least to the satisfaction of some of the members these questions. Why? Because God ain't making any more land. This is a huge uh, parcel that has the potential for huge impacts for the region. And we, we, wanna, we wanna make sure that uh, we are marrying the right companies uh, together. Finally, this is the dating phase again, when uh, Member Johnson introduces the overlay, we'll get a detailed look at uh, what's going on and what is being proposed. So we have time. I think it was a good exercise today because you've got to experience some of the areas of concern that the chairman uh, and the members have. And so hopefully, um, and we appreciate you coming in to Philadelphia to take on this mammoth project, but however, and nevertheless, it has to be uh, inclusive. Uh, and I guess that's the best word. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Councilmember Jones. As you were given that recitation of zip codes, I was trying to slip in a couple zip codes that our next uh, member of council would like to ask questions, especially 4 4 and 3 8 and 3 2. And um, with that, I will recognize Councilmember Bass for questions. Well, thank you very much. I have a whole bunch of zip codes that I would like to include in that <laughs> um, and, and make sure that folks are included. But seriously, um, I, you know, like many of my questions and statements have already been made, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, I think what is important here is that we recognize a couple of things, and that is that, number one, Councilman Kenyatta Johnson has a history of following up, following through, and ensuring um, diversity. When you look down uh, at the casino in his district, when you look at, you know, things that have been built in his district, uh, under his leadership, he has ensured that people of color, and particularly African-American men and women in Philadelphia, uh, have an opportunity to participate economically. I don't think that there's anything worse than seeing something built in your community and you sitting on the sidelines as a bystander and uh, other folks from other communities coming in and uh, receiving the lion's share of the jobs, of the opportunities, of the income, uh, of all of the economic benefit. And so I just know that uh, I, I'll just say that I have a lot of faith in Councilman Kenyatta Johnson that he will uh, make sure that um, you know folks are properly represented. Uh, I stand at the ready to be of assistance. If I can be of help to you, Councilman, in that area, please feel free to count on me. Um, and beyond that, um, uh, regarding Hillco, I just want to say that just today uh, I was made aware of. Uh, a huge development. I won't say who the developer was. We're all very familiar with it, but um, near my district, a huge development in which there were uh, promises made and then the developer, after it was all said and done, they walked away. They walked away from the community benefits agreement. This is a highly success successful project and we cannot allow that to happen again. So I know that the councilman will be on it. Uh, all, all eyes will be on uh, this project. It's an incredible piece of real estate. This is an incredible opportunity, I believe, for Hillco and for the city of Philadelphia. And uh, so we're just going to uh, be paying attention. And we look forward to receiving and writing uh, as much documentation on previous projects as you can provide so that we know what your track record and your history is. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Bass. I'd like to recognize Councilmember Heenan for another uh, question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, again, thank you, colleagues. Uh, and we, we ought to be we ought to be proud of uh, this body with the depth of of the uh, questioning. And I want to echo a couple uh, and just make some some statements to to both Jerry and. Uh, and, and and Kevin, you know, regarding this this process, and you know, uh, as we welcome, we really do, we welcome it. So, you know, to uh, Councilwoman Sanchez's, you know, I think I think she said it 
uh, best where, you know, we want this 1300 acre to reflect the values of our policies here in, 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 in this body. And I think uh, that's, that, that should be a demand, not, not an ask. Uh, so we're asking, you know, that you work with uh, Councilman Johnson all right, who is collaborating with us to make sure that we get there and we get there quick. All right, because I'm hearing a little conflicting uh, timelines on uh, closing uh, when the time is right when we get closer to closing on, on the property. Well, I thought that was going to be this week or next week. Uh, so, um, you know, the timing of this is now. Uh, and it's not in September and it's not uh, when we come back and, and do the zoning overlay because most people do come to us right, with KOCs with an EOP plan. I mean, you're getting off kind of uh, light on the, uh, the information that's being requested right? because, you know, other people have uh, continued hearings. And then I don't want to continue this hearing. I'm not suggesting that. Right? But, you know, other people have right? because they failed to have a final economic uh, opportunity plan. They failed to uh, introduce and talk about their community engagements and policies that reflect this body. They failed to have an economic impact study uh, submitted as an attachment right, to the K KOC plan. So there are some of the things and discrepancies that, that I am uh, you know, concerned with. I just want to make a, a point of information. If I can um, recognize Councilmember Johnson for a point of information. Yes, and, and thank you very much. And I thank my colleagues for just for just doing their due diligence. I, I do just want to mention one key component. I want to make sure that everybody receives information on um, in the process of me meeting um, with the developers, uh, with their team, and just doing a deep dive around um, some of the key areas that were just mentioned regarding the EOP plan, um, the community benefits agreement, and the community engagement component. Um, the focus was around the overlay process. I just wanted to mention that for the record, because normally um, that's how that process has worked um, in the past. And so not to contradict anyone else's statement, but nevertheless, uh, that is our key focus of making sure that information is provided. But my focus is primarily looking at the overall overlay process because that's when the EOP process is actually triggered as, a, as well as the letters of uh, recommendations from various RCOs um, that normally are required to sign off before we even introduce any pieces of legislation. And that information will be forthcoming. Um, but I do um, thank everyone for the questioning questions as well. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, Councilmember Heenan, uh, please continue your round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Councilmember Jones or Johnson, uh, you're right. I mean, they, you know, you, we're having, uh, you know, uh, conflating conversations and discussions, sorry, one, you know, with the KOZ and the other, you know, that's typical talked about you know during the overlay uh, EOP plan although it's not uh, they tend to be with both uh, mostly in the KOZs uh, prior to that um, all right so I have three questions um, and the and then I'll end with just uh, a recap on one hold on one second there's some um, sound in the background please mute if you are not speaking um, please proceed Councilor Mahina thank you okay so so I have three questions, and then I'm going to end it with, you know, just a recap, uh, not recap conversation, but recap, recap topics in which, by the way, I will work with and uh, the Councilman Johnson as, as a sponsor because he, he does know how to collaborate with, with his colleagues. All right, so my first question, uh, Jeremy, maybe uh, you can enlighten us on uh, Sparrow's Point in Baltimore. Uh, we, you talked about it, have, and has... How have we learned anything? Have you learned anything uh, in Baltimore uh, that uh, will help here in Philadelphia as far as not necessarily the governance process or, or uh, your communications? But I mean, did you meet all your commitments in Sparrow's Point? And how is it going to be different to Philadelphia? Because we're not Baltimore, although we can learn from it. And we're not Chicago. We are Philadelphia. So that's my that's my first question. 
you know, thank you, Councilman. Um, we, we have, yeah, again, this is, <clears throat> we have met our commitments of trade funding. Like I said, it was before my time when everything was set up, but it's a very successful development, creating thousands and thousands of jobs. And uh, the remediation and the project couldn't be going better. Um, so I, I think from that perspective, it's, it's a very successful project that we're, we're proud of. Um, and, you know, we plan on doing the same, the same here and working with the city of Philadelphia in partnership as we move forward. Okay. Uh, second question is, uh, are there any other, are you seeking and are looking at other incentives, approvals, or grants that is uh, critical for your project moving forward or in, in, in a certain uh, phases of its development over the, over the next decade? So at, at, at this time, you know, obviously it's a multi-million dollar investment. It's very complicated um, as it relates to the remediation, the demolition, and decommissioning. Um, so at this time, we are not. But you know, again, in the future, um, it's it's hard to say if you know something like that would be pursued. But we are privately funded. Um, we are we are not for more than you know the KOZ at this particular time. Okay, and are there any? Uh, my last question, and then and I'll end with uh, just a very, very brief. I promise to all my colleagues and and to all on the call, uh, I will end with a recap of just topics real quick. Are there any other issues uh, that you have concerns with, and that you're trying to work through at this moment? No, Councilman. I, I think the 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 nice thing from all the time we had to do due diligence here. And all the outreach that we've done initially with the city of Philadelphia, Councilman Johnson, with labor, um, with all this, with, with the stakeholders in the area, um, has really given us a lot of confidence on how to execute on this business plan, what's required from a community perspective, but then also just the physical construction to redevelopment. Um, understanding, you know, obviously with our with our consulting team and our experts, um, what's required from a remediation perspective. And to actually, you know, put this back into commerce, we've had a lot of time to do that. So we feel very confident, and we're excited about putting this back into commerce and creating an economic engine. Oh, and and you, Jerry, we we are the same, I and mean, we were excited about that. There, especially in light of uh, this, you know, uh, international pandemic that we're going through. Uh, now's the time to create jobs, not uh, put up obstacles or you know making it making it too difficult. Uh, are you building? on spec or do you have end users or tenants uh, that you are and i don't need you to disclose it you know, because of uh, uh you know confidentiality but are you are you are you going to be putting out to bid uh for for tenants uh as you build this on spec or do you have one uh, end user that you uh, that you were in negotiations with so, so we are committed to building on spec we're, we're hopeful that as that process starts and we do get through um, you know, the early phases of the development, we're, we're able to get commitments um, from different customers looking to invest in Philadelphia before before we put a shovel in the ground. So hopefully it's a combination of both, but we are fully funded um, you know, to move forward on a speculative basis. And then I'll say we also are not looking at one customer. That That's the nice thing about the approach here. It'll be, you know, multiple customers um and different businesses that are looking to invest in the business park correct and which leads me into my uh, next question is whatever uh, agreement that or so are you going to be is hilco going to be owner developer owner or both or just owner we, we are owner developer we are the lead on the development roles and responsibilities okay, so our great that, the interaction with the city of Philadelphia will be with Hilco um, and our local team, um, which, you know, are, you know, some of the folks on the phone from Stradley Ronan, others, you know, um, from Dilworth, um, Paxson and, and different, you know, team members that we've hired uh, to join our team here several months ago. Great. And, and that is uh, wonderful to know because then you are uh, the decision makers and you know when we come up with a, a policy and, and, and there's an agreement that's made for the overall uh, site that we're discussing now uh, 
I would hope that there will be agreements that goes to the tenants as subleases. Uh, are you guys willing to entertain that? Yes, we, we are willing to work with the city. Um, and quite frankly, early on in the process, when we are talking to tenants, get get them in front of you um, just to understand exactly you know what their proposed plan is, both from a hiring and operational perspective. And you know they're going to want to you know have have the same questions, quite frankly. Um, so we are committed to working together in that regard. Uh, well, uh, I want to thank you both for. Um, you know, answering as best of your ability at this time, uh, the questions that we have here at the body and look forward to uh, continuing with that along with, well, you know, through Councilman Johnson. Uh, so Councilman, I know you're on the line there. Uh, I will be putting a, a list of uh, questions and recap, you know, from this hearing to you and, and love to be a part of pipeline and operations and construction and how we can uh, really, you know, be a, uh, a an, an example of repurpose and reuse of industrial properties. And and lastly, I just want to say, Dwayne Baum, thank you so much. I don't know what the city would do without you, and we appreciate all your time and dedication to public service. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. I want to thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Heenan. And I'd like to recognize Councilmember Allen Dom for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Councilman Johnson, <clears throat> for all the work you've done on this. And uh, I guess my questions are for Mr. Gray and, and Dwayne Baum. And basically, look, I think what I'm hearing from everyone is that we all want you to come to Philadelphia. We want the jobs. We're very appreciative of it. We want to see our economy grow and expand our tax paying base. Everyone wants that. I think the overriding factor is we want to make sure proper wages are being paid and Philadelphians have an opportunity for those jobs. My question most of them have been answered, but my one question I had for you that you may or may not know is, do we know the economic job multiplier for each one of these 10,000 jobs? You know, in the technology field, the economic job multiplier is five to one. For every tech job we create, we create five other jobs. Do we have any of that information of these 10,000 jobs? Yes, Councilman. Thank you for the question. It's a good one. Um, I do not have that in front of me right now, but the economic impact studies that we are going to submit will also include indirect jobs, which we did not um, talk about today. And you hit it on the head. You know, if you have this, if you have 10,000 people working uh, at the PES site, the city of Philadelphia, there's going to be a ripple effect in a positive way that more jobs are going to be created. You know, jobs you know, related to restaurants, hotels, etc. That information will be provided to the city. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Councilman Johnson. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Dom. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Are there any other witnesses to testify on bill number 200347? Well, Councilman, if we're wrapping up, I, I did just want to thank everyone for providing the opportunity for Jeremy and I and Dwayne to appear before you today. Um, and I did want to emphasize uh, my chairman, Bill Sasso, has committed to HELCO that he'll be personally involved in the community engagement. As we all know, he's very involved with the community. And we look forward to responding to the specific questions and putting together a letter and working through Councilman Johnson's office to not just answer the questions, but provide the backup documentation we've talked about today. So I just want to thank everybody. And I, I also want to thank all of the city officials, all the council people for everything you've been doing over the past few months. We all know that it's been an incredible trying time for our city. And we thank you for your extraordinary time and efforts on behalf of the city. Thank you, Mr. Boyle and Mr. Gray and Mr. Bum for your testimony. We look forward to the follow-up information that was requested by members of council um, regarding this bill number 200347. Uh, there being no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I will ask if there's anyone else present at hearing one final time whose name we have failed to call that wishes to offer testimony on any of the bills being considered today. 
Hearing none, I would like to thank all the panels and witnesses for their participation. We value your opinions, and I now invite all panels and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting before we go into our public meeting. We'll now pause a few moments um, from these proceedings briefly to allow this, these participants to leave the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Appreciate it. Look forward to a good partnership here, and we, we are very excited about this. This concludes the public hearing of the committee. Uh, we will now reconvene the public meeting to consider action we're taking on the bills before this committee today. Okay, I uh, hear some noise in the background that please put yourself on mute. We should only be having members of council um on the call at this point if you are a witness um who is privily testified um please remove yourself from the call any others please put yourself on mute so we can go into the public meeting uh, for those members of council if you could put yourself on mute Uh, we would now like to convene the public meeting. Uh, Mr. Iannuzzi, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Uh, members that are in attendance will please indicate that they are present when your name is called and say a few words to when you're responding so that way we can make sure that you are properly recognized and we can hear you speak. Council Member Cindy Bath. Good afternoon, I am here and present, thank you. Council Member Alan Dom. Present. Good afternoon, everybody. Council Member Helen Gim. Present. Council Member Bobby Heenan. Council Member Bobby Heenan is present. And thank you. Council Member Kenyatta Johnson. I'm present, but I'm technically not on the board. Committee. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Curtis Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rep Curtis Jones is here representing 19131, 19139, 19151, and many more. All of those zip codes. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member David O. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the hearing. Councilmember Maria Quinona Sanchez. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councilman Johnson, for allowing us um, to uh, open up this process, and I appreciate your collaborative efforts. Chairman Derek Green. Uh, present. And before I recognize Councilmember Jones for a motion on Bill Number 200347, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Heenan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And before uh, it is put up for a motion for approval to, to move uh, at a committee or, st or to stay in committee, I just want to say for the record that I will be uh, voting in favor of moving it at a committee all right, with the contingency before we vote fully on the floor that you know we have in writing some of the answers to some of the questions that we uh, had discussed here at today's hearing. So thank you for your time and I appreciate your patience. Thank you, Councilmember Heenan. At this point, I call on Councilmember Jones for a motion on Bill Number 200347. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that Bill Number 200347 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation. Okay. And I further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at our next session of council. Second. Second. Uh, it has been moved and properly seconded by Councilmember Maria Kiana Sanchez. 
that bill number 200347 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Uh, this concludes the business before this committee on finance today. I'm going to thank all members of council and their staff for their participation on such a lovely day in June to allow us to have this meeting of the finance committee um, taking place today. Thank you for your attendance and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you.